In this lecture, we're going to talk about laminar boundary layers. There are two types of boundary layers we'll focus on in this course, laminar boundary layers and turbulent boundary layers. Uh, laminar boundary layers, we actually have an analytical solution for, well, it's a computational analytical solution for what the boundary layer looks like. Um, for turbulent boundary layers, we have to rely on what are known as semi-empirical approaches to get the boundary layer profile, which basically means we combine a little bit of analysis with some experimental data. But for laminar boundary layers, we actually have a solution for that. It's not a solution that you can see kind of written out in, um, you know, in uh, equation form. It's, uh, it's written out in equation form, but then it has to be solved numerically to within whatever accuracy you want. The solution that we use is called the Blasius solution, and it's based on a solution um, by a guy whose last name was Blasius. Essentially what he did is uh, his, his uh, graduate advisor, he was a graduate student, and his advisor was Ludwig Prandtl, who I've mentioned in a previous uh, lecture. Ludwig Prandtl developed the boundary layer equations. They were just simplified form of the Navier-Stokes equations, taking into account that boundary layers tend to be kind of thin as compared to the distance from like a leading edge of a plate. So boundary layer starts at a leading edge of a plate and then grows as you go down stream. But the thickness of that boundary layer is typically assumed very small compared to the distance from the leading edge of that plate. And by making that, knowing something about that kind of scaling, Prandtl was able to simplify the Navier-Stokes equations into a set of equations that are a little bit simpler, for, simpler and they were called the boundary layer equations. And then he had a really good graduate student his last name was Blasius, who actually solved those boundary layer equations for uh, laminar flow over a flat plate with no pressure gradient. And that's the solution that we'll use in this course. So that's what we're going to present today. Uh, go ahead and take a look at your screen. The picture here is of a, um, a fighter aircraft. I'm not sure exactly what kind it is, but what I really wanted to show in this picture was the inlet for the aircraft jet engine. So this is where the air is coming in, obviously. But you'll notice that it's sort of offset from the surface of the, the aircraft. It's not, not flush right up against the side, but it's actually offset uh, you know, a couple of inches from that. And the reason they do that is because of the development of a boundary layer on the surface of the aircraft. So you can imagine, for example, I'm going to sketch this out. Let's say this is kind of the, the nose of the aircraft. And then you have your jet engine intake over here. There's a, you know, as the flow comes in this way, you're getting the development of a boundary layer, right? Well, the boundary layer has what we call low momentum air coming in. It has air with not very much energy associated with it because the velocity is small. Velocity is small because of the no-slip boundary condition against, against the wall, right? So if I sketched out the velocity profile here, you can see in the boundary layer, the velocity is small. So this is the boundary layer region here. The velocity is small in that boundary layer region. So that air has very little energy associated with it. Plus, the, plus there's a velocity profile to it, so the air is not even coming in with a, a uniform velocity profile. We don't want to have that kind of air going into the jet engine. We want air that has a nice uniform profile to it. Uh, we want air that's coming in with a lot of uh, energy associated with it. And so we try not to not try not to bring in that boundary layer air and so in order to avoid that what we do is we offset the engine so the engine intake is right here you can see it's offset some distance away from the surface see that over here as well uh, so that we don't bring in that boundary layer air and instead we have nice uniform air that's all very high energy coming into the engine so i thought that was kind of an interesting application to show you with boundary layers all right, so let's talk about the uh, Blasius solution for laminar boundary layer. And the geometry that Blasius solved for looks like what we have in the picture here. We have a uniform flow coming in, capital U velocity. We hit this flat plate, so this is just a plate. And as soon as the fluid hits that plate, it sticks to it because of the no-slip boundary condition. And it has zero velocity there. Far away, it still has the velocity capital U. We're assuming that there's no pressure gradient. This term, no pressure gradient, just means that the velocity out here is uniform. If there was a pressure gradient in the outer flow, then the outer flow velocity would change. Right? Because the, there's a pressure gradient, it would change the velocity out there. So this is a situation with no pressure gradient. Um, so we need to go from zero velocity to the outer flow velocity. 
And outside the boundary layer, the velocity profile is uniform, nominally. And inside the boundary layer is where all the velocity change occurs. So we have this uniform flow hits the plate, no slip boundary condition. You get the development of the boundary layer. There's the 99% boundary layer thickness. And then it just continues infinitely downstream. So that's the, the geometry that Blasius solved for. And the solution that he developed is not a solution you can write down like y equals you know, some function of x. It's a, it's a differential equation, essentially, is what he um, solved the equations down to. And then you can solve that differential equation numerically. And so it's considered an exact solution to within whatever numerical accuracy you want. So, you, so we can't actually write down the equation, but we can solve for it numerically. And the things that we typically solve for include the boundary layer thickness, the 99% boundary layer thickness, the momentum thickness, the displacement thickness, uh, the wall shear stress, and a drag force. And I'll explain all those in just a moment. So let me just show you what those come out to be. So over here, we have the 99% boundary layer thickness, just made in dimensionless form. Since we did our dimensional analysis, we now hopefully are converts to showing things in dimensionless form. So here's the 99% thickness made dimensionless by the distance from the leading edge of the plate. So if this is our 99% thickness up here, x is our distance out to that point. Okay, And then that's equal to 5 divided by the Reynolds number based on that, that distance x. So the Reynolds number, I guess I have it down here, right here. The Reynolds number based on x is the free stream velocity or the outer flow velocity times our distance x divided by the kinematic viscosity of the fluid. Remember that kinematic viscosity is just dynamic viscosity divided by the density of the fluid. So the 99% thickness made dimensionless by the distance x is 5 over the square root of the Reynolds number. So that kind of profile here um, has a square root sort of shape to it. Um, so if, if, you, if you rearrange this, what you'll find is that delta goes something like the square root of x. So that's what that profile looks like. You can get that just directly from here. The displacement thickness is given here. So it has the same kind of uh, 1 over square root of x, uh, Reynolds number uh, based on x profile, but the numerical value is smaller. And then here's the displacement thickness. I'm sorry, the momentum thickness is that one. So all three of these thicknesses just come straight out of that Blasius solution. Uh, some other quantities that are typically of interest are the wall shear stress. So this would be the shear stress acting at some point on the wall, tau w. So that, that's presented here as being a dimensionless quantity. So it's the wall shear stress made dimensionless by the dynamic pressure of the free stream or the outer flow. So that's 0.664 over the square root of the Reynolds number. Notice that we're dealing with a stress here. It looks very similar to what we have for the momentum thickness. Remember that in the last lecture when we talked about different uh, boundary layer thicknesses? Typically, when you deal with um, forces, stress is like a force per unit area. When you deal with forces, the momentum thickness usually shows up in there. And so you can sort of see that right here, kind of a relationship to the momentum thickness. So this is called a friction coefficient. It's just a dimensionless wall shear stress. Now, one of the other things that's typically of interest is the drag force. So imagine I, I have all these wall shear stresses over the whole length of this thing out to a distance x. So we have all these different wall shear stresses. Let me integrate those up and then find the total drag caused by all those wall shear stresses. So that's what this quantity is. This is a drag coefficient. And all it is is the drag acting on this plate uh, made dimensionless by the dynamic pressure multiplied by L. L would be the distance out to where you want the drag. So let's say I wanted the, um, the drag over the whole length of the plate out to, out to this point here. So L is that distance, and I want the drag caused by all those shear stresses all the way out to that point. <clears throat> that L is just the, the drag over that distance L. Okay, 
And so that's how the drag is made dimensionless. And to find the drag, you're just integrating up the wall shear stress times the little areas dx's. So dx would be this distance here. So it's just the wall shear stress times dx times 1. I'm assuming unit width into the page. So that's what the drag is. And then if you do that calculation using the Blasius solution for you know the tau w here, then it comes out to be 1.328 divided by the Reynolds number based on the length, which is given here, raised to the 1 half. So the CF just allows you to find a shear stress at a point. The drag coefficient allows you to find the drag force over some length. Okay, it's, they're, they're different quantities. Shear stress at a point is the, drag co is a, is the friction coefficient. The drag coefficient finds, allows you to find the drag force over some length. And the drag coefficient is just the integrated friction coefficient. Every time I've teach, taught this course, um, you know, we give problems where we want people to find the drag acting on a plate because of the boundary layer. And I would say 75% of the class goes through and tries to integrate this on their own. They try to integrate it by hand. You can do that. And it'll work and it'll give you the right answer as long as you don't make mistakes. It's much, much easier to find the drag force just using the drag coefficient all you know, right here. We've pre-integrated, we've already integrated for you the drag, the friction coefficient. So don't feel like you have to go through and integrate the wall shear stress over the length to find the drag force. You can do it as long as you're careful, but it's been pre-calculated for you in the drag in the form of the drag coefficient. So if you're trying to find a drag force over some length, just use the drag coefficient. Okay. So these are all the expressions that we typically use when we're dealing with a boundary layer. Now this is specifically for a laminar boundary layer, and so there's a Reynolds number restriction on it. And we've talked about this before, I think back when we talked about the Navier-Stokes equations. When you're dealing with um, solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations, and the Blasius solution is kind of a subset of that, we typically have to assume, well, we, almost, we always have to assume that we're dealing with a laminar flow. And so the Blasius solution is really only for laminar boundary layers. And the laminar boundary layer will occur if the Reynolds number, based on the x position, is less than about 500,000. Okay. Now, why 500,000? It just that's just experimentally a good engineering rule of thumb. Okay, It's not anything magic like at 499,999 it's laminar and 500,001 it's suddenly turbulent. It's the, the, there's a transition from laminar to turbulent over some range of Reynolds numbers. But as an engineering rule of thumb, just use 500,000 as kind of the dividing line between laminar and turbulent. Okay. Uh, now, Think back, what was the uh, critical Reynolds number for flow through a circular pipe? If you can remember back to the Navier-Stokes solutions for what's known as a Poiseuille flow, flow through a circular pipe, do you remember what the critical Reynolds number was for that between uh, laminar and turbulent flow? It's about 2300. Okay, quite different than this. So it's 500,000 for flow over a flat plate, 2300 for flow in a circular pipe. For Couette flow between two parallel plates, the critical uh, Reynolds number there, I think, was about 1,600 based on the, the distance between the plates. So they're all three different numbers, and it's just because uh, they're found experimentally. There's no reason they should be exactly the same because they're just different geometries. Okay, so remember this 500,000 number. So when you're dealing with Reynolds numbers less than about 500,000, then this Blasius solution is valid. If you're dealing with Reynolds numbers greater than 500,000, then it's not valid. You should use some other expression, which we'll talk about in a different lecture. Okay, these equations, uh, you don't have to memorize those. Those will be available to you on a, like a formula sheet, or you can look them up on the web. Um, but just keep in mind that they're really restricted to laminar boundary layers. All right, uh, just to kind of show you how well this Blasius solution works, I've got a picture here showing uh, experimental data compared with the Blasius solution. So the, the picture here is kind of flipped around than what we're normally used to. The vertical axis is the dimensionless velocity, so U is the velocity in the, in the boundary layer, capital U is the outer flow velocity, 
And then on this axis is a dimensionless vertical position. Why is the vertical position? So the, the picture we're looking at is this. Here's Y. Here's our profile. Here's the capital U outer flow velocity. And this is our little u. And so Y is the distance from the plate surface here. Capital U is the outer flow velocity. X is the distance from the leading edge. Uh, it'd be like the distance from the leading edge out to this point. And then the new here is the kinematic viscosity, just the dynamic viscosity divided by density. And uh, what you see here are different symbols. These are different Reynolds number values. And this actually goes from about 100,000 all the way up to about 700,000. I know here I just told you that the transition Reynolds number is about 500,000. Here they go up to 700,000. Again, it's an engineering rule of thumb. If you're very careful when you perform the experiment, then you might get transition occurring at a Reynolds number of a million. Okay, if, you're, if it's a really noisy environment, lots of vibrations and things like that, the transition Reynolds number may be 100,000. Okay, so 500,000 is just kind of a rule of thumb. But anyway, you can see the experimental data for the velocity profile shown here is the symbols, and then the line is the Blasius theory solution when you solve that differential equation numerically. And you can see it works very, very well. Right? It's, it's a, almost a perfect model when you compare it against experiments. I, I flipped this plot around to make it more natural looking for us. So you can see the, the, the symbol, I mean, the, the text here has gotten all mixed up because I've kind of turned it and flipped it. But here is the way we normally look at it. Here's the Y coordinate made dimensionless, and here's the velocity profile. So, you know, the, the flow is going this way. And then again, out here is the capital U velocity. So I just, I just wanted to show it to you in a different way, just in a way that's a little more natural for us to, to see it. So anyway, the point I want to make with these plots is that the Blasius solution works very, very well when you're dealing with laminar boundary layers. But you have to make sure the Reynolds number is less than about 500,000, as we've shown here. There actually is another restriction on the Blasius solution. You don't hear about this one as much, but the Reynolds number needs to be greater than about 1,000 also. So I'll make a note here. You should also try to make sure the Reynolds number is greater than about 1,000. And the reason for that is because the Blasius solution is a solution to the boundary layer equations, which themselves are an approximation to the Navier-Stokes solutions. To go from the Navier-Stokes, uh, uh, sorry, Navier-Stokes equations, to go from the Navier-Stokes equations to the boundary layer equations, there's an assumption about the Reynolds number being large. And uh, and so if you're dealing with Reynolds numbers less than about a thousand, then then the boundary layer equations really aren't valid anymore, and so the Blasius solution wouldn't be valid. Um, so in reality, the Blasius solution is actually pretty good from about 1,000 to 500,000. Uh, for our purposes, even if the Reynolds number is less than 1,000, go ahead and use the Blasius solution. It'll be close enough for you know first cut back of the envelope engineering calculations. If you want something more accurate, you actually have to rely on um, an empirical or an experimental kind of curve fit and uh, to get you closer to the real life situation. So anyway, anything that's less than 500,000 for our purposes, treat as uh, a laminar boundary layer and use the Blasius solution. Okay, I think that's all I want to say about this. Uh, I have some examples. Go back up here to the top. I have some examples uh, that you'll want to take a look at where we use these relations, these Blasius relations, to solve some boundary layer problems. So you definitely take a look at those. They'll all be in separate videos.